are going to get started. Um, my name is Jessica, and I'm happy to welcome you to our webinar today on the New Foundations for Safety Leadership OSHA 30 module. Uh, as the host for today's event, I am also tech support. Um, so I'm just going to go over a few things. Uh, if you look in the Q&A, we have some conversation going on about uh, the audio for the event. Um, I guess you may be listening on your phones or uh, via computer. If you're having difficulty listening through your computer speakers, I would recommend calling in for improved sound quality. And that information can be found um, via your quick start screen or the event info tab next to the presentation. Um, there's a phone number and attendee ID and all the information you need for that. We do have videos in today's presentation, um, which just always, unfortunately, create some complications uh, with sound. So if you are listening to audio through your computer, you may hear an echo when we play the video uh, as it will be coming through both the phone and the computer. Um, so I apologize in advance for that. Again, um, probably the best sound quality that you're going to get for today's webinar is to go ahead and call in for the event and uh, mute your computer speakers. Uh, we will take time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. Um, you can put questions in the Q&A box at any time. I will keep track of them as the presentation goes on, and then we will do our best to answer questions in the order they were received at the end. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded, so if you are interested in reviewing or sharing the information after the event, we will make it available via email to everyone who's on. Um, I also, uh, there is going to be a poll question up shortly, um, so we would really appreciate uh, any feedback on that. Uh, you'll see it on the right side of your screen as soon as I get that up. Um, if you could just take a quick second to answer that question, that would be really helpful for us. Our presenters today are Annette Brom, uh, who's the Assistant Director of Training Programs in the Directorate of Training and Education at OSHA and Linda Goldenhardt, uh, who is the Director for Research and Evaluation here at CPWR. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get that poll set up, and in the meantime, Linda, I will hand it over to you and Annette. Okay, great. Thanks, Jessica. So uh, Annette's going to do a brief intro here, and then we'll go back to, the, to me. Hi, everybody. Um, for, for some time, OSHA has recognized the need for, to introduce workers who have either a supervisory role or safety responsibility on job sites to leadership school skills. Uh, too often it's assumed that because someone has been put into a leadership role that they understand what that means and that it's easy for them to adapt to being, being in a um, supervisor um, or management role. So OSHA believes that by creating strong leaders, we can reduce job site injuries and fatalities. So when CPWR was able to develop the Foundations of Safety Leadership module for the Construction Outreach Training Program, it's a perfect addition to the 30-hour construction class. It not only provides the knowledge and skills for new and existing leaders, but it also reinforces forces the purpose of the outreach training program through educating in hazard awareness and recognition and the role that leadership plays in educating the workers. We're very excited about this new module and I'll talk a little bit more about how after Linda's presentation about how it works within the outreach training program. So right now I'd like to introduce Linda um, Goldenauer who is the lead on this research project. And she's going to introduce the new module to you and show you how it works. Linda? Great. Thank you, Annette. Um, so I just wanted to um, point out that that poll question is up for everybody. So if you can just uh, take a minute and click on that. Are you an authorized outreach trainer, yes or no? We'd really appreciate it. But I just want to thank everyone uh, for being here and for your interest in learning more about the Foundations for Safety Leadership module. Today I'm just going to share a little background on why and how it was developed 
and give you a sneak peek of what's in it, and then it'll get back to Annette. She can talk more about how it gets, as she said, how it relates to the OSHA 30-hour course. So in 2014, as part of our five-year cooperative agreement proposal to NIOSH, we included a research project with the goal of developing an evidence-based leadership module to be offered as an elective in the OSHA 30-hour course that would introduce trainees, particularly those with resp supervisory responsibilities, to a number of critical leadership skills that they could use to improve safety outcomes and safety climate. The impetus behind this project was based in large part on, a sur on survey data gathered in 2012 by McGraw-Hill in partnership with CPWR, showing that many construction companies, regardless of size, require their new foremen or lead workers to take the OSHA 30-hour course, hoping that it will give them the skills to become the safety leaders that the folks desired. But since OSHA focuses, uh, the OSHA 30 hour focuses primarily on hazard recognition and awareness, we concluded, and as Annette just said, uh, OSHA also came to this conclusion that it provided the necessary and important, but perhaps insufficient training for these new job site leaders with respect to leadership. While some larger construction companies, insurance companies, and unions have started addressing this need by offering their own safety leadership training, there are still many foremen and lead workers out there that wouldn't have access to it. So today's webinar is serving as the official announcement that we have reached the goal that I showed you before, and that as of January 1st, the Foundations for Safety Leadership, or FSL as I'll call it from here going forward, is an elective in the OSHA 30-hour course, thanks to all our partners, and with special thanks to Bob Murphy and Annette Brom at, at, at the Directorate of Training and Education. We're very excited about this. So, oops, this is the old one. Oh, well. Um, anyway, creating the FSL was definitely a team effort. And so this is the primary research team that was together uh, putting the um, FSL together. And there are other people on the research team in Boston and at West Virginia University who are helping with the evaluation. There, we also had our instructional design partner, Metamedia, plus, and most importantly, our 17-member multidisciplinary CDT, or curriculum development team, which includes experienced OSHA 30-hour trainers, union and non-union construction workers, safety and health directors from large and small construction companies, safety consultants, academics, as well as Jim Maddox, the former director of OSHA's construction directorate, and Ken Kroll from the Directorate of Training and Education. The research team met in person and virtually with, C with the CDT and received lots of great input and guidance from many subject matter experts and industry stakeholders, including NIOSH's NORA Construction Sector Council and members of OSHA's Advisory Committee for Construction Safety and Health. We asked for this input from all these folks because we wanted to make sure that the training addressed the needs of our key target audiences which includes folks like you who are on this webinar and, of course, construction foremen and lead workers. So here is a high-level outline of the two-and-a-half-hour FSL module. There's a full complement of teaching materials for trainers to use, including a comprehensive instructor guide that has questions and classroom activities for engaging the students in discussion. There's a student guide and also a hard hat sticker and a wallet card with leadership skills. The instructor can have the stickers and wallet cards printed out to give to the students at the end of the class. In terms of structuring content, the first third of the course covers a variety of important topics, such as the costs of ineffective leadership, the benefits of, of effective leadership, how leaders can improve safety climate and safety outcomes, 
and most importantly, the five critical leadership skills, which I'll talk about in a minute. The second part of the course gives the instructor the opportunity to let students apply the information covered in the first section by working through real-world construction scenarios, either by watching a video, taking turns, reading through the scenario script, or doing a role play, and then participating in discussion and other classroom activities. <clears throat> so this is the opening slide for the course. Each of these icons are buttons, which are hyperlinked, that will take the instructor either to the foundational material or the in introduction or to one of the seven scenarios. Since I have a limited amount of time today, I selected just a few slides to, in to uh, share with you from the intro part, just so you can get a flavor of uh, what it contains. So here are the learning objectives. Um, we paid attention to the guidelines provided by OSHA, DTE, of what kinds of things they uh, expect in curricula. So we uh, followed their guidance, and we have three objectives, and here they are. And then we spent a lot of time discussing what a safety leader is or should be on a construction site. Went back and forth, we had many different definitions, but we decided on this one because the FSL links leadership skills with improving safety and safety climate. So this is how we define it. And we particularly focus on the uh, word courage, and in the class we ask students to talk about what that means, why is courage emphasized in this definition. And then we have the five leadership skills. And we had to, there was a much longer list of leadership skills that we started with that we learned from other training courses that have been developed from the academic literature, from lots of different places. And we decided on these five, and the CDT and other folks helped us decide because they thought they, these were most critical for foremen and lead workers to use for positively affecting job site safety, climate, and safety outcomes. So here are the five. A safety leader leads by example, engages and empowers team members, actively listens and practices three-way communication, develops their team members through teaching, coaching, and feedback, and finally recognizes team members for a job well done, or going above and beyond for safety. For each one of these in the curricula, there are how-to slides that give students practical ways to put these skills into action on the job site. Okay, so that is a really quick peek at some of the foundational information covered in the first section. I'm going to do the same thing for the second section. Excuse me, where students can apply their newly gained knowledge. <clears throat> Again, working closely with the CDT and other subject matter experts, we created seven scenarios and made sure that they were real, that they realistically depicted the job site setting and potential safety situations. This slide contains icons that are hyperlinked to each of the seven scenarios. The last one, are, contain the takeaway messages uh, that we wanted people to take away from the FSL. So today I've chosen to show you one scenario, and that's the last one. It's called Fritz's Shortcut, or Fritz Takes a Shortcut. This is the open scenario slide, and it would look similar uh, in front of all the other scenarios for all the other ones a similar look, so we kept the look consistent. And um, it contains the icon that you saw before, the characters, in this case Fritz and Elliot, and icons that'll take, buttons that'll take the instructor either to watch, read, or to the role play, depending on what he or she would like to, which teaching mode he or she would like to use. Um, the key safety leadership moment in Fritz, in this scenario, is how a leader 
handled a near-miss incident after he made the decision to put productivity before safety. Um, as we go to the next slide, and I'm going to hand it over to Jessica, you'll see three video segments, which is how all the scenarios are set up. First one sets the scene, and we call that the situation. In the second segment, or the first outcome, the characters deal with the safety situation without using the leadership skills. And then in the third segment, or the second outcome, the characters deal with the situation using one or more of the skills. Fritz, this scenario, is designed to illustrate the leadership skills of leads by example, engages, empowers team members, and actively listens and recognizes team members for a job well done. You'll also see, and Jessica's going to take you through it, although she's going to ask you to mute your computer, you'll see there are discussion questions in between each of the video segments that are a trigger to have discussion with the class uh, about what went on in the previous segment. Okay, so Jessica? Thanks, Linda. Um, as Linda just mentioned, I am going to recommend that if you are listening through your phone, turn off your computer speakers uh, to avoid any feedback here. And if you are listening through your computer, I apologize, there may end up being a bit of an echo. The crane operator gave Fritz Mighty Mechanical's foreman, the wire rope slings and shackles they will need to lift two HVAC units to the roof. And Fritz gave them to Elliot, an experienced worker. While inspecting the equipment, Elliot notices that one sling is severely kinked and a shackle is damaged. So he tells Fritz they should ask the crane operator for replacements. Yeah. Fritz knows that getting replacements would take hours. And earlier, he sought help from the GC about the tight timeline. So he tells Elliot to go with what they have. Elliot tells Fritz that he's not comfortable with the decision to proceed with the current rigging equipment because it will create a really unsafe situation. Fritz reminds him that as his foreman, Elliot just needs to do what he says. As one of the units is lifted, the kink sling abruptly stretches. One end of the unit drops six inches, and the damaged shackle breaks open causing the unit to fall to the ground, severely damaging it and nearly crushing a worker. All right. Linda? Yeah. You still there? Okay. <laughs> Did you want to go over any of the discussion questions, or should I just go to the next video? You can just go to the next video. Later, Fritz tells Elliot not to mention the damaged breeding equipment to anyone. Elliot is angry about Fritz's request, but he wants to keep his job. Later, Fritz tells Elliot he was right to question his decision and says he did it because the GC has been pressuring him. But if that worker had been crushed because of his bad decision, he couldn't have lived with himself. Fritz calls for a safety stand down. He repeats to the crew what he told Elliot, adding that from now on, he's going to hold a daily safety huddle to discuss the day's tasks and how to eliminate hazards that may come up. He says he has learned the hard way to listen to his crew's safety concerns and expects everyone to report unsafe situations. Fritz ends by saying that he doesn't want to lose any of them due to poor decisions, pride, or ego, some of the bad behaviors he displayed today. Jessica? Yes. Oh. 
do you want to um, tell folks, do they have to unmute anything now or? Uh, everyone should be fine, um, but if you aren't hearing anything, unmute whatever you muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so that was a very brief introduction to the FSL, I mean very brief, and I don't know why when it switched over to WebEx, it's got the um, counter down at the bottom, that doesn't show up typically when it's we're using the videos. And of course, the sound quality is much better when you're listening to the videos, not through a phone, through a computer, or whatever. That's through a webinar. Anyway, so I just um, I did do a longer webinar on the FSL back in March, and Jessica's going to send that link in the follow-up uh, email she'll send to everyone. So if you want a longer version to get more in depth before you decide to download the materials, you can do that. And I just wanted to share a couple of comments that you might find interesting. The first is from a corporate safety director and trainer who's been teaching the FSL for about six months. He's from Vimeo Construction. He visited the job site a month after the training to speak with a foreman about how they'd use the information from the FSL training, and here's the, what they told them. They initiated a smaller huddle approach that used to be 100 people, and now it's 30 at the most, and how the FSL supported that. The second one, Diane Malachowski, Program Director of Region 1 OTI, had this to say after Bob, of the corporate safety director from the first comment mentioned the FSL to her, or uh, taught the FSL to her outreach trainers and OTI instructors at Keene State University last week. So that was exciting. And the final quote is from a safety director from a company who is participating in our current evaluation activity of the FSL. So speaking of evaluation, before I end, I just want to let you know that our research team is still recruiting companies of, of certain sizes and types to participate in the evaluation study, in Denver and Boston and Pittsburgh areas. So if you think that's something you'd like to do, you can contact me and, and I'll talk to you more about that. And also, uh, in addition to the FSL being a big uh, part of the uh, new OSHA 30 hour elect as an elective, which Annette's going to talk about, companies can also use it on their own or as part of their, as part of their own training uh, that they do uh, at the company. So thank you for your time, attention, and interest in the FSL, and now I'll turn it over to Annette. Okay, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about, once again, about the safety uh, leadership elective and then also about changes that are within the outreach training program. I've been watching the questions that people have been asking and um, I'm probably going to end up answering most of your, the questions I've seen so far. So, um, so the first is in talking about the foundations for safety leadership. The, as as uh, you are aware, those of you who are outreach trainers know that the outreach training program it was developed to educate um, workers and employers in hazard and awareness and recognition. And so we felt like this leadership skill, this was a missing piece for us. And so when CPWR was able to uh, receive a grant to develop this material, this was a great opportunity for us to be able to implement um, leadership skills into our program. So it's going to be an elective in the 30-hour construction outreach class, and somebody did ask about if it could be presented in the 10-hour, and, and no, it cannot. It's a two-and-a-half-hour module, and there is not time in the 10-hour. Plus, the 10-hour is really meant for workers um, on a job site where the 30-hour is intended more for those who have some level of supervisory responsibility. Um, and no, there is not going to be, uh, right now, there, this is not um, available for the, in the general industry, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so it will be an elective in the construction outreach classes. 
Um, in order to receive the materials, the education centers will be providing information regarding how to conduct this leadership module during their train, uh, outreach trainer and their update courses. And they will prov um, are able to provide you with materials, but they also um, will be able to, you also will be able to download this on CPWR's website and also on OSHA's outreach training page, uh, program webpage. Those materials are available now. Um, all of you should have, those of you who are outreach trainers should have received notice from your education centers um, about the new changes, and that includes this module. So OSHA um, put out the new outreach training program requirements and industry procedures on January 1st of 2017. They are effective as of April 1st of 2017. The, um, all of the outreach trainers must be familiar with under, and understand those updated documents. So if you've not received those from your outreach, from your education center, please contact them or go onto OSHA's website to download. All of the documents are available um, on our website. Some of the changes to the new, to the outreach training program, um, the, the trainer code of conduct, trainers may not cancel classes without reimbursing for fees, and they may not schedule multiple classes at the same time. Trainers uh, must make payment to their authorized training organization, otherwise known as your OSHA Training Institute Education Center, before you can actually receive your 10 and 30 hour cards that you're requesting. Um, we also are extending the requirement for professionalism to include your interactions with your um, OSHA Training Institute education centers, and that you, as a, as a trainer, you must maintain possession of your outreach trainer card. You must display that trainer card at each of your outreach classes. We are doing this because, um, as many of you have probably heard, there have been numerous fraudulent cases um, of individuals who are not outreach trainers, who are um, teaching classes, uh, taking the individual's uh, money, and then they don't receive a card, and then they find, and, and find out that they don't, aren't even OSHA authorized trainers. So we are now requiring that all trainers be in possession of their trainer card when they teach. Um, some record retention. The, uh, Clarification of the record retention requirements that they must, you must retain your records for five years, and those records have, are subject to verification upon request from OSHA or your education center. Um, it extends the replacement cards request from three years to five years. Since you are required to maintain your records for five years, we felt like it was only reasonable that um, individuals can get a replacement card for up to five years and you need to maintain an address to receive communications. We receive, OSHA receives hundreds of calls from um, individuals who've lost their cards and they don't know who their outreach trainer is and they believe that we maintain a master database of everybody who's ever taken the outreach training class, which of course we have not. Last year we trained, over 900,000 workers were trained in this program. And so trainers need to make sure that whoever they train, that they know how to get in touch with them. Um, and also, and the other part to that is that you as a trainer must make sure that you keep your address up to date with your education center. Uh, you, and you must utilize the current outreach training program report, which all of you are familiar with. And then your sign-in sheets and topic outlines there's some more requirements for what must be maintained. Some of those uh, must be written on your sign-in sheets, and some of that is the location, the actual city and state where the training is occurring, the date, and there are some other um, uh, things that must be put on your sign-in sheets. Contact hours, we've had a lot of questions related to contact hours, and I should point out that all of the changes in, this, in, the, um, new, in the outreach requirements and the procedures documents have come about because of questions that we've received from our education centers, 
from our outreach trainers and also from when we've been in the process of doing investigations. Um, and so these are some of the things that have come up. So the contact hours does not include time that you may spend on a test or administrative matters. The daily student contact hour limit is still seven and a half hours, but there must be an eight hour break required between the sessions. This really happens more for our um, online providers um, where this has become an issue. We have reduced the minimum class segments from 60 minutes to 30 minutes. This was in particular a major issue for outreach trainers who were teaching in a classroom environment. So um, they have, uh, so we've reduced that. And you may not combine industry classes. You cannot teach a construction class and a general industry class at the same time. We've made a change to exception requests. In the past, if you were requesting an exception on things such as geographic jurisdiction, you wanted to teach um, overseas, out of OSHA's jurisdiction, you wanted to um, teach a class, You say you were teaching a, at a conference and you wanted to be able to teach longer than the seven and a half hours, your class size, um, or you were, were going to request to teach through video conferencing or webinar. Those uh, exception requests used to come to here to OSHA, but because our education centers work so closely with our outreach trainers, um, we are now delegating that down, to that review and that approval authority to the education centers. We're also looking more at alternative training methods. Um, and, and what I mean by that is video, such as video conferencing. The uh, initial review and approval it would, it is going to be through the OTI education centers. And I would suggest if you look at these types of, if you look at video conferencing that you pay very close attention to the new requirements. There are many requirements. Um, that have to take place for, to do video conferencing. We now will grant you, the education centers have the ability to grant you an approval up to 12 months, and then, um, and that's at the discretion of the education center. But for those new, some of those new requirements for video conferencing, um, it has to be in a classroom setting. So that means that you cannot do video conferencing for somebody who's sitting at their desk um, it has to actually be in a classroom setting. Has, you have to have proctors in each of those classrooms. You have to have sign-in sheets. And like I said, there are a lot of other requirements, so I would pay very close attention to that if you are looking at making these. Um, these. We also are going to be looking at industry-specific sector special emphasis topics. Now, the... Um, and this is really meant for larger organizations, for uh, unions, uh, labor organizations, maybe associations who may want to be interested in having some type of 10 or 30 hour um, car that is that it's still construction, still gen industry or maritime, but is very specific to their industry. In order to get approval to do that, those um, organizations must submit their requests here to us at OSHA for our review. And along with that, they will, you will have to submit your topic outline, any training materials that you intend to use, and then once approved, those materials will be made available to all, all outreach trainers. Um, we want to ensure that because this program um, as you all know, is a voluntary program and it is meant to train in hazards specific to a work environment. We want to ensure that no workers are left out of any of these special emphasis type uh, topics. And then um, OSHA will approve or work with you on how to improve your um, submittal and it will require an annual review, revision and a review by OSHA. 
outreach monitoring, training program monitoring. Um, trainers, as you all are very familiar, you receive record audits and training observations from the educa your education centers. And tr so now trainers who do not provide advance notice of training when requested by an education center or respond to a records audit request will not be issued student course completion cards. So if you receive a, a letter from an education center and saying that you need to do a record, submit your records, you do not submit those records, you will not receive your um, course completion cards and you will be subject to corrective action by OSHA. The primary outreach trainer uh, who is teaching the class may not use a trainer who's on OSHA's watch, watch list as an assistant trainer. They may not assist you in any way. If they're on the watch list, they've been suspended or revoked, and so um, you may not use them as assistants. If for suspensions, revocations, and, pro and probation, this is for all industries in which the trainer is authorized. So. If you were um, an investigation, you're an, say you're an outreach trainer for construction and general industry, and the investigation was on um, construction, but you were also a general industry trainer, you are suspended from both. Um, we, we have found cases where somebody was a, we were, where we were unaware that they were an outreach trainer in another industry, and they were suspended and they, um, try to continue training. Now there's very simple, just a couple things as far as the industry, actual industry procedures are concerned. This, this first one applies to all, whether you're construction, um, general industry, maritime, or disaster site. The prerequisite, um, as, you, as you should be aware, the prerequisite requirement is five years of safety experience related in that industry. So, but if you, you can use um, education as a substitution for two years of experience, we have made, um, clarified that and that has to be a bachelor's degree or higher and it must be in, in occupational safety and health or industrial hygiene. So if you have an environmental degree that does not count as, um, a count as a substitution for two years. The construction specific is the new 30-hour elective for the Foundations of Safety Leadership, and we um, will be asking um, with, within the year, we'll probably be sending out a survey asking you if you're using this and how you're using it because we're very excited to see um, the, the usage of this and see how it's used. The disaster site worker was originally a 15-hour class. There is now also a seven-and-a-half-hour disaster site worker class. And then um, if any of you are from Maritime, there used to be number designations for the 10- and 30-hour classes, and we no longer um, have that. It's now just going to be 10- and 30-hour. And then before I answer questions, the last um, slide is if you have any questions regarding the outreach training program requirements and procedures, please go to your authorizing training organization, which is your education, OSHA Training Institute Education Center where you took the course. If you have any industry specific sector special emphasis topics as we talked about, if you're looking at that type of program, doing something specific for your industry, Jason Gear is our outreach training program coordinator and um, you can contact him. If you are getting questions from the public or you have any other types of questions, please go to outreach at dol.gov and, uh, and um, we will respond to your questions. Now, I know I have been watching that there's been a lot of questions coming about, so I hope that, um, that uh, Jessica has been able to. It's, no, I, I think I've been keeping track. I've been trying to keep track and uh, mark which ones you already answered. Um, so I'm just going to start reading through them and see how far we can get. I apologize if I missed something that you did already answer, Annette. Um, 
Well, actually, I think I can look at them too, right? Uh, yes. Okay, so the first one I see is, can this be presented in an OSHA 10 hour? And no, it cannot. Um, of course, if you wanted to, to teach it on top of your 10 hour, you, you have every ability to do that, but, but it won't fit in um, to, the, to the 10 hour class. Um, yes, uh, many of this, the leader definitions, many, much of the leadership. Um, Matt, can you read the question out loud before oh, you answer? I'm sorry. I'm, it on the screen. sorry. Um, it seems the safety leader definitions would fit general industry as well as construction. Any thought or work toward a similar program for general industry? Yes, you are correct. This would be a wonderful program in both the general industry and the maritime industries along with the construction. This program, because it was developed by CPWR through a grant, it was developed specifically for construction. And so the scenarios are for construction. And we have already been talking here at OSHA about how um, down the road would we be able to um, change those scenarios to make them more applicable to general industry. So my hope is that, yes, we will do that at some point in the future, but I'm afraid at this point in time, I don't have a time for when that will happen. Um, a question, will this material, when will this material be available for us to use in our outreach courses? Um, you should have received this information um, already from your education center. And like, um, as I stated earlier, this is available on OSHA's website on the outreach training page um, and also outreach training program webpage and also on C CPWR and your education centers can also assist you with getting those materials. Um. Uh, Annette, um, speaking of getting the materials, um, someone just commented that the uh, link on the OSHA website might not be working. Oh, really? Um, I, will, I will check that when we get you now. I'll check that. Thank you for letting me know because it was working last week. Okay. Um, and this next question is is um, probably is really more for Linda. Um, if if I'm teaching a class and have a mix of supervisors and equipment operators, how do I add this module? Um, so in, he's saying workers and their supervisors. Um, it doesn't say, it just says a mix of supervisors yeah. and equipment operators. Well, it's certainly the case that um, non-supervisory personnel can and have benefited from learning the material. And there are some worker um, characters in here who actually do take on leadership behaviors and practices. What I would suggest strongly that you not do is if you teach a class that you not have a worker and their supervisors. It's not good to mix um, or within a company have the safety director and other management level people in with the foremen who are learning it. So it's best to keep the classes um, single, you know, role type of folks. As long as there aren't differential in, you know, supervisory reporting and stuff like that, it's fine. Uh, that's the thing that I would definitely stay away from, though, is having classes where you have people who report to people in the same class, because we've seen over and over that uh, people don't they don't feel it's free to open up and have discussions. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Somebody asked, what are the major changes in the updates? I, I kind of went through them, and, but they're also, um, you would have provided with a, with a um, sheet through your education centers when they informed you of the new changes. Um, can I scan my card and incorporate it as a slide at the intro to OSHA? Yes, absolutely you can. If you have one of the new cards, you, uh, either, whatever you do, you need to make sure you have scanned the front and the back. Um, and especially in particular with the new cards that has the QR code on the back. So um, yes, you, that, you are able to do that. Um, let's see. 
very concerned about the quality of online providers. Um, I'm afraid I, I, I can't respond to that. Um, uh, one thing I, I will say is at the moment um, we're not thinking about this as an online course just because what we found in uh, presenting it is the the interaction and discussion between the instructor and the students and the students and the students is so built into this that it really is an important part of it. And, you know, if an online provider can look at this, and we have, you know, Click Safety was on our CVT, and so we've, they've asked us, it's like, well, it's, it's really up to OSHA uh, if they want to do that. Well, um, and but, I, I'm glad to hear you say that, Linda, because we've been having the same discussion here, and we are in agreement with you. This really, this program so, really does not lend itself to being yeah. in an online format. The what is so imp so impressive and important about y your module is that it's the hands-on and it's the discussions that occur um, in the classroom setting. So uh, no, okay, we're good. We're not in we're not intending for it to be online. Okay, thanks. Um, does the outreach trainer still need to submit the request 60 days in advance? Um, I think, I, you can't quote me on this one, I think we changed it to 30 days, but you need to look at the requirements because we have some that are 30 days and some that are 60 days. Um, are there now requirements for how tests are administered and do instructors have to retain a copy of the test given? Oh, we have no requirement for tests. So. Um, in the 10 and 30 hour. That's why we explain we, um, that if you give a test, um, it, doesn't, it cannot count in that 10 and 30 hour time frame. Um, uh, and your question about out of jurisdiction courses, um, yeah, I think I, I think I answered that about uh, 60 days in advance. Um, you'll need to check the, the new requirements. Does the proctor have to be an authorized trainer? No, they do not have to be an authorized trainer, um, but it would be very, you need to have somebody in there who can answer questions if, if your, your actual outreach trainer isn't, going, isn't able to answer questions. Um, but no, the proctor is, is expected to be there to make sure students are in the classroom the entire time, that they sign the sign-in sheets, that they receive all of the materials, and that they are able to um, collect questions um, like on breaks and things if the instructor isn't there, but um, they don't have to be an authorized trainer. Um, can the sign-in sheet and student name and address be on the same document? Um, it, yes. Um, remember, you have to have a sign-in sheet for each day of class. So you can't use one sign-in sheet for the whole week, but it, you can have your student names and addresses on the same document. Will these slides be available to us? Um, Jessica, they're going to be available, correct? Yes. Uh, I will either later today or more likely tomorrow, I will email out um, both a recording of the live event as well as the slides and some additional uh, information to everyone, including uh, links to the materials. Uh, and I did get additional reports that the OSHA links are working. Um, so I'll, just, I'll make sure everyone who attended and everyone who registered gets all of the information via email. Okay. Um, is the advance notice for training for all future classes or when requested to notify the OTI? I think you mean the OTI Education Center, not the OTI. Um, it is when you've been requested by your education center um, to do advance notice. Some of our education centers require it all the time, every time you teach a class. Some require it when they're interested in conducting, eventually conducting a training observation of your work, or um, they've been instructed to require um, you to do advance notification through because of OSHA, OSHA has requested that. I would recommend you include two-year Associate of Applied Science degrees, as I'm assuming is for education substitution. 
we looked carefully at um, these requirements and we, our intention is not to, look, uh, to include the two-year associate's degree. We're only looking at the bachelor's or above for that two-year substitution. Would a construction management or construction engineering degree be acceptable? No, it, it would not be. It has to be in occupational safety and health or industrial hygiene. Um, Somebody, uh, Jessica, someone asked, will this training be av available in Spanish at some point? I'm, ass I'm assuming they're talking about this presentation. Yeah, uh, that would be a question uh, for, for Linda, I think. They're talking about the um, FSL training. Yeah, uh, currently there is no um, emphasis to um, try and make this into a Spanish speaking, you know, um, module. It's not to say we wouldn't, and if we got feedback of how best to do that, that would be great. Um, but we are, just to let you know, we, this, everything is 508 compliant for those of you who have interest in the, um, having it available for folks with disabilities. And we're hopefully going to also be doing closed captioning on the video, but we're still working on that. And somebody did point out, they said the links on OSHA.gov are working or were about 15 minutes ago for Foundations of Safety Leadership. So thank you very much for checking that. I'll also check that when I get off the phone. Um, uh, Linda, somebody has asked, can this program be used as a standalone? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and um, that was on my my last point that companies, we've had lots of companies already using it, Dimeo Construction, uh, Warfel, others who have used it in their ongoing safety programs to add to it or even as a standalone otherwise. So uh, it is available on CPWR's website to download. Feel free to contact me. Uh, if you want more information, and we've had lots of company use, companies use it already, and so far, so good. It's been really great feedback. Somebody has asked, is anything being done with the places who offer a 10-hour class and market it as an OSHA class, but it's not? It's a hazard awareness only. I've seen so many people mistakenly do this. Um, we... Um, We've been having numerous cases of, of what we consider fraudulent training where um, individuals are told that one, some of them are told you have to take this class in order to go to work, um, which is not correct from OSHA's perspective. Um, some are in cities and states that require it, but that the people, the jobs that people are doing are not in jobs that require it. Um, or that they're, they pay for a class and they are supposedly taking a 10-hour class and it's a two-hour class. When they're, in the case, in the, there've been very, very few cases where they've actually been outreach tra our authorized outreach trainers and in those cases they're revoked um, um, from ever teaching OSHA classes again. But in most of this, this situation that, you, that the question came up, most of those, those individuals don't belong to OSHA. So we have been working with, um, in some cases, when we can actually find those individuals, we've been working with um, other governments and, other, and state enforcement um, agent organizations, agencies on trying to, um, um, to stop these individuals. So if you ever happen to hear about these or you know about these, please go write out as give us as much information as you can to, to the, the um, um, email address outreach at dol.gov because we are um, trying to track down every one of these that we can find. I see there's a question here, what's an example of how to participate in the Boston area? If that person could um, contact me, my email will be on the slides and we can talk about that. And anyone else who might be interested in hearing how to participate in the evaluation of the FSL. 
Um, the next question, I am due for the update, class, update trainer class in July. Are these going to be incorporated into the update courses? Absolutely. Um, the education centers have already, are already prepared to incorporate um, the, these programs and these changes. Um, Linda, I think this one is maybe more for you as to hand out materials. How much do we have to provide and, well, maybe not. This might be both of us. As to handout materials, how much do we have to provide and what method is acceptable for delivery? CD, flash drive, or paper? Um, oh, you mean for the students? Is that yeah, the I'm materials? Not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if that's, if that's if you or, or me on the outreach side. I can just tell you that we expect that there be a handout for every um, topic that is taught. And it should be, um, we, at this point in time, we expect it to be a handout since many workers get you, you unless you can, you know that by um, giving them a, a, a CD or thumb drive that they have the ability to take those materials and, you, and utilize them. But we would much prefer that they be given a handout. And Linda, I don't know what it's like. If, well, but answer. so, yeah. So for instructors, we have developed a very comprehensive instructor guide for how to teach the FSL, the tips for how to teach, and time management, and questions, and activities, and all sorts of things for the instructor. There's also a student guide um, for instructors to use with the students, and then um, there's a wallet card and a hardhead sticker, but um, so it is available and presumably it would be printed out on paper. Okay. Um, does the student address have to be personal or is company address okay? The address has to be whatever the student wants it to be, not what the employer wants it to be, but what the student wants it to be. And I would um, caution all of our outreach trainers, we have we here in OSHA continually receive calls from employees who have been told that their, their um, employer will not give them their outreach card or that they have left their, the employee and the, once again, the company owner um, will not give them their outreach card. OSHA is not, the, the card belongs to the employee, the worker, the person who took the class. OSHA doesn't care who paid for the course. The card belongs to the worker. And so, um, and as an outreach trainer, you are required to make sure that the student is the one who receives the cards. We always encourage employers to have, to make copies of those cards in case they're lost. It's easier for us to trace and to get a replacement but those cards belong to the, the worker. So whatever address, whether it be a personal company address, it has to be whatever the student wants it to be. How do you know if an instructor is authentic or not, even if they show their card since, fraud, since fraudulent activity is going on? With the new, um, on OSHA's website, on the outreach training page, um, we do show examples of what the cards look like. The, um, the new cards as of last March of 2016, we have the, um, they're new, now plastic cards. They're more difficult to, um, to copy. And the ba on the back of them, there is a QR code. And if you scan that QR code, that will show, take you to the education center that authorized that card and will um, tell you that, that it is an authentic card. So that is, is one way. Someone, okay, you hear me? So, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm, okay, this one, relating to contacting my, o, I, my OTI, or I think you mean your, your OSHA Training Institute Education Center, not the OTI. The OTI is here at OSHA um, early for a class. Those of us that teach the OSHA 30 class in the community college sometimes add this class with one day or week notice. If I need to teach this class with one day notice, will my education center let this be enough time? 
you need to, um, we encourage the education centers in those situations to work with you. So you need to, uh, as soon as you know that's gonna happen, call your education center on the phone, talk to them and let them know, and then follow up with an email to make sure that you have it all documented. But we, we understand and the education centers understand that that does happen. I see a question here about the hard hat stickers available for purchase. You're right, printing out the sticker won't make it stick to hard hats. What I've done in the past when I've presented this is um, sent them to Kinko's or their other online printers and they're like very cheap to make them into um, stickers. And so the materials have the template and the PDF available that you can send for both the card and the stickers and get a you know whole roll of 500 of them for $10 or something like that, pretty cheap. Right. What, um, how do we contact the panelists? I see that Jessica said that our, their, our contact information will be in the email that she sends out. And so please feel free to contact me if you have any questions related to the outreach program or the education center program. Um, I teach at community college. We have capacity to use Blackboard in the classroom. Co computers are available. I like to use PDF versus handout. Any problem with that? Um, I'm, f I'm very familiar with Blackboard and I, I, don't, I don't see that as a problem. Once again, as long as your students have access um, to be able to get that materials after they leave the classroom. You answered the question about hard hat stickers. Although there's one way at the end that says won't stickers cover potential defects and protective helmets. Um, my understanding is there is an OSHA ruling now that people can't have stickers all over their hard hats. Um, so, you know, that's not my area, but they still have hard hat stickers, so. Um, is it acceptable for the worker to carry a copy of their OSHA outreach card? Um, since for OSHA, the outreach training program, the 10 and 30 hour cards, this is a voluntary program for us. We do not mandate anybody to have this class. And also it does not meet any of the OSHA training requirements that are found within the OSHA standards. So we do not require that a, a worker carry their OSHA outreach card. Now they may be working in a state or a city that has an, um, implemented a statute that requires the card. Or, they may, or their employer may require it. In that case, they need to speak with their individual um, state or city that, that is requiring them to have their cards. Um, the cards being provided by certain online providers is not the new cards. Can you explain, are they still valid? Yes, they are still valid and, and by the way, the. The older paper cards will always be valid. They don't expire. The construction and general industry cards do not expire. Um, the maritime cards are the only ones that expire every five years. The reason that the online providers, all of the author, OSHA authorized online providers are still pro, um, process using the, um, providing the paper cards. And, and that is because of the issues we're having here at OSHA with trying to transfer that that process um, to our education centers. We are working on that, and I'm, hoping, I'm hopeful within the next six months that the online providers will hopefully be able to provide the plastic cards. Up in, but for now, they still are the paper cards and they are valid. Um, I'm searching OSHA.gov under the training requirements and materials link and cannot find the FSL manual material. Um, you, you need to be in the outreach training, pay, outreach training program webpage within OSHA, the OSHA.gov and um, that material, that's where we have linked that material. How does having a felony affect a trainer? What types of felony, how is that determined? Um, that's a difficult question to answer. I can just tell you that um, if you are an outreach trainer and then you, um, um, then you have a felony, um, we, 
in previous cases, we have suspended those individuals, and it, but it depends on the type of, um, on exactly what happened. So if you have some specific questions and you want to call, call, call me, Jessica's going to give you my information. You're welcome to call me and we can discuss that further. Um, and I think there were just a few outstanding questions um, that since we're running over time, I'm just going to read out loud real quick, and I, some of them only came to me. Um, and then if, if we missed some, our apologies, everyone can just email me with their questions that we missed, or um, we all have the presenter's information to contact them directly. Um, but one of, the first one I have is, um, is the FSL available for general industry 30-hour? Yeah, I explained already, right now it's not. Um, the OSHA website says new focused form materials. How new uh, are they? When were they updated? No, those are not new focus four. They they are the original focus four. They're okay. not the, the focus four themselves are not new. Okay. Um, can this be used to fulfill applicable parts of the OSHA 20 hour leadership program endorsed by the OSHA ET and D partnership? Um, that is a totally separate program, and it's not part of this. Um, since it is a prerequisite, will we be receiving a certification for this module? Um, we don't. OSHA doesn't certify um, as an. If they're meaning, you know, something different as an outreach trainer, outreach trainers are not certified. They are authorized by OSHA, so I'm not sure I understand that question. Okay. Uh, whoever asked that, feel free to give some clarification. Um, but otherwise, I will just move on. I just have one more. Um, does OSHA have a copy of the card, um, or can you utilize the card request letter that has names and card numbers? Does OSHA do you have to have a copy of the card? I think that's, sorry, I think it's do you have to have a copy of the card or can you utilize the card request letter that has names and card numbers? Oh, do, okay. I'll answer that in two ways to make sure I'm answering the question. If you're meaning as a trainer, do you have to have your actual co your actual trainer card? Yes, you have to have your trainer card. No, no, no certificate of completion, nothing. You have to have your trainer card. If you mean um, do you have to continue to keep a copy of, e of each student's cards that you receive, that, that you teach, or can you just list the card request numbers? No, you cannot just have that, a, a letter that says with the card numbers. You have to actually have a copy of the card for each student in your records. Okay. Um, just one more. Uh, will the OSHA program requirement PDF be updated to note the requirement to display a training trainer card? Um, it's yeah, it's on there. It's in the new requirements. It's on the website right now. Okay. All right. I think I hope we answered all of the questions. Um, thank you so much for everyone who remained on past the hour. Um, and thank you so much, Linda and Annette, for giving your time uh, to do the presentation and answer all of these questions. Um, we really appreciate it. It was great. Thanks, thanks. for yeah. thanks, Jessica. Yeah, thanks for thank you, Jessica, and thanks uh -huh. for the opportunity for for us to be able to present today. Of course, and uh, to everyone listening, once again, I will get a recording of the event and powerpoints and of the contact information to you. Um, if not this afternoon, then by tomorrow for sure. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.